Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. We're gonna be looking at two ads by the famous and infamous P.T. Barnum. These ads are both from 18, the 1860s. Now P.T. Barnum was known for his publicity stunts and his exaggerated kind of way of advertising and promoting himself. The Barnum and Bailey Circus was the most popular venture, I guess, that he was involved with. That's what most people would recognize. He really used a lot of showmanship and a lot of antics and stunts and over-the-top methods for advertising things like, well, in this instance, a museum. Nowadays, museums kind of have a connotation of being places that are, in general, kind of boring. I know if you're anything like me and you like to learn, you might find that to be a bit of a shock, but the reality is most people kind of find museums boring. And even though there was a lot less entertainment back in 1860, which is 160 years ago now, still compared to a lot of other things you could be doing, a museum might still be thought of as kind of a relatively boring thing to do. I'm sure people were curious. I'm sure people enjoyed them. But like I said, just compared to some other things that you could do with your time, it's not always the first pick. So what did P.T. Barnum do to overcome this challenge? He used a lot of sensational advertising. The first one we're going to look at here is for Barnum's American Museum. And we have this illustration of a hippopotamus, actually two hippopotamuses. And there's a man there with a stick who looks like he's kind of training them and they have their mouths open to show their big teeth and they look enormous. And it says the living hippopotamus or river horse from the river Nile in Egypt, of which the above is a faithful illustration. Now at the museum is the greatest curiosity ever exhibited in this country. He is the first and only real hippopotamus ever seen in America is engaged at an immense cost for a short time only and should be seen by every man, woman, and child. For fuller description and other novelties, see daily papers and small bills, admission to all, 25 cents, children under 10, 15 cents. Now, one thing to note about this advertisement is this ad itself would have been in a newspaper. And apparently what Barnum would do is take up two or three columns in these one column newspapers. So normally a story or an ad would just take up the place of one column. And what Barnum would do would be to purchase two or three full columns and put one ad across the entire three columns, which was basically unheard of at the time and considered kind of flagrant and in poor taste. But that is how you get, a, get attention. So that's the first thing to understand about this ad is that it would have taken up the space of two or three newspaper columns. So this is a, probably a pretty big ad in a newspaper. And in order to get people into the museum, he chose to feature a rather sensational exhibit that was at the museum at the time, which is a living hippopotamus. And he says it's a living hippopotamus or river horse. So for someone who's never seen anything like that, he lets you know what it is right away. It's a living, it's a hippopotamus and it's going to be alive. And he relates it as a river horse. So people probably had no idea what a hippopotamus was back in 1860. I mean, if they had an idea, they certainly hadn't seen one, not if they were in America. So instantly he gives it that colloquial name, River Horse. So they have some type of frame of reference for understanding what the heck this thing is. And then he quickly says, from the River Nile in Egypt. So this is an exotic item. And if you look at the illustration, the guy who's taming the hippopotamus or, or training or whatever he's doing, he's dressed in some kind of exotic clothing as well. He's wearing, it looks like a turban of some kind. So this illustration paints the fact that this is an exotic creature. We're told what the creature is, and we're told it's from an exotic place, which is Egypt. Then we're told that the illustration is a faithful representation of it, and we're told straight up that this is the greatest curiosity ever exhibited in this country. Okay, so you've got a lot of hype right off the bat, a lot of reason to pay attention. And then in bold, the first and only real hippopotamus ever seen in America. There's a lot of clout that comes with being the first of anything. So when you are, you might as well tell everyone, right? This is the first and only real hippopotamus. And by saying it's the only real hippopotamus, you're kind of calling out any competitors who might claim to also have a hippopotamus as being phony or fake. And then another thing he spells out right in the ad is the fact that it's engaged at an immense cost for a short time only. So he spent a lot of money to bring this here and it's only here for a short time. So these are just a couple quick reasons why people would want to attend. People are interested in things that cost a lot of money. And if something is for a short time only, then you have to act fast in order to get it. So for a simple museum ad, this has quite a lot of showmanship, quite a lot of character. It's got a lot of attention getting value just from the illustration alone. He plays up the exotic nature of it. He tells how great it is. It's the greatest curiosity ever exhibited in this country. He plays up the credibility of being the first and the only real one. He gives a few reasons why. 
people might be interested in seeing it other than that for the fact that it costs a lot of money to get to the States and that it's only for a short time. So this quick ad, not only is it a very large ad in the space that it was in and gets a lot of attention, it also aims to move the people who see the ad to come to the museum by playing up the exotic nature and the exclusivity and the limited time only, the urgency required in order to actually see the animal. Now onto this second ad by P.T. Barnum. This is from the 1860s as well. This one doesn't have an illustration, it's just ad copy. And I'm just gonna read it down here. Barnum's American Museum, P.T. Barnum proprietor, J. Greenwood Jr. manager. Open day and evening, performances twice a day. This most attractive place of public entertainment in New York, comprising the substance of seven museums in one, and combining with this unparalleled collection of curiosities to which novelties every day are being added, a perfectly chaste arrangement of family amusements. In the lecture room, in the shape of moral dramas, select comedies, correct farces, popular songs, pretty dances, etc., all of them modest as well as mirthful, adapted to gratify the most fastidious taste without offending the most conscientious principle, and presented in a manner that, for ability and propriety, surpasses all competition. Admittance to the performances, as well as all the curiosities, 25 cents, children under 10, 12 and a half cents. I think it says 12 and a half cents there. Now, one thing to notice about this ad, I mean, back in the 1860s or so, they didn't use headlines so much as they would just say the name of the store or name of the brand or name of the product at the top. So here we have Barnum's American Museum. But if you kind of take a full glance of the ad in its entirety, that's not the most eye-catching aspect to it. What jumps out to me is what would be called this, as Dan Kennedy might say, double readership path. You have these bolded and larger type sentences that tell a story in themselves. So at a first glance, what you might see from this ad is open day and evening, seven museums in one, family amusements, surpasses all competition. And if you're just looking for something to do, that's really all you need to know. If you have a wife and kids and you're looking for something, some kind of entertainment, those four things really tell you everything you need to know to get your interest, to get your curiosity, to look further and to either read the rest of the ad or just read the bottom and see how much it might cost. You have open day and evening, which means that it's accessible almost any time. There's seven museums in one, which makes it sound like you're going to see a ton of stuff. Family amusements. It's obvious P.T. Barnum wanted the whole family to come to the museum, not just for, say, men. You know, this is not a burlesque show. This is family entertainment. And then surpasses all competition. Just kind of a boastful statement. P.T. Barnum, after all, was a great master of exaggeration and excitement. So saying it surpasses all competition is actually a pretty timid statement coming from him. Now, looking at a bit of the language that he uses in the ad copy itself, he uses phrases like this unparalleled collection right? This, this collection stands on its own. It's unparalleled. It has no competition, right? That's what he's saying when he says it's unparalleled. There's no competition, which again is echoed in large type at the bottom with this sur surpasses all competition. He mentions that novelties are being added every day, which lets people know that this is not some old dusty museum. It's pretty active. There's a lot going on. And you can tell that this ad is directed towards families and family entertainment, mostly because he comes right out and says family amusements. He takes it even further than that when he describes them as a perfectly chaste arrangement of family amusements. Uh, chaste just means not derogatory, not sexual, you know, family oriented. He goes on to describe moral dramas, select comedies, correct farces, popular songs, pretty dances. He describes them all as modest as well as mirthful, you know, so fun funny, in good taste, and they're humorous, and adapted to gratify the most fastidious taste without offending the most conscientious principle, right? So this is all language that lets people know that everything is in good taste, and this is a family-friendly environment, basically. Now, one thing he does before he mentions that it surpasses all competition is he prefaces that statement with this, presented in a manner that for ability and propriety surpasses all competition. So he does qualify that statement a little bit, which adds to the believability. It's kind of like a push and pull when you make a statement that pushes onto the believability and pushes it to the limit in the reader, like something that this surpasses all competition. You also want to pull back a little bit and say, hey, well, for the ability and propriety, right? So, so you're promising something big, but you're also saying, hey, this is big, but it's big for us. You know, this is something amazing. Hey, but it's amazing in this way. This is something that's life-changing, but you know your life can change in many ways, right? <laughs> so there's this push and pull that adds believability to statements, to exaggerated statements. And that's just a short example there at the end. 
So overall, these ads, they're not using much in the way of slick persuasion tactics, but instead use either a large illustration or this kind of double readership path, making it easy at a glance to understand what the ad is about so that it draws people in to read more. So again, these ads are from 160 years ago. And but for the language that's used, which is a little formal, you'd likely see things just like this being used in similar ways to this day.